Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Right? Merry Christmas Eve. It's, it's great to have everyone here and to be able to celebrate and have Sunday morning on Christmas Eve. Uh, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the miracle of your son's birth, the miracle of Jesus' birth that we can celebrate during this time. Lord, I thank you for everyone here this morning, those watching online, and I thank you for the community that we have here at Frontline Bible Church, being able to be believers, part of your body, and that we can come together and worship during this time. Lord, I pray that your words through Scripture would impact us this morning, and that we can go out and share this fearlessly and courageously to those around us. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, now, I have to be truthful with you. I uh, was not planning on preaching this morning. Um, Pastor John was supposed to be. But he calls me yesterday about noon saying he's not feeling well and uh, he's got a fever, uh, but that he's pretty sure he might still preach. And I'm like, well, okay, I don't know about that one. So I just start preparing. <laughs> and uh, he ends up texting me later in the day, maybe 5, 5 p.m., saying that he's got COVID actually and he's not going to make it. Um, so yes, don't feel bad for me that I have to preach like that. Feel bad for John that he's got COVID. And uh, be praying for him and his family that no one else gets sick. And they can still celebrate tomorrow as well. So uh, I wasn't planning on being here, but somehow I was able to prepare even a slideshow for you guys. Uh, the miracle of Canva, right? Everything's already made for you. You just steal something that's already there. Um, and honestly, you know, as for experienced pastors, it's not an unusual thing to have to fill in last minute. A lot of them, you know, would just go back in the archive, pull out something they've already preached. But... For me, I haven't preached on Christmas before, so I don't even have that luxury. This is my first time on Christmas, so you got to experience it with me. <laughs> Woo. But honestly, I'm not too worried because if you're going to fill in last minute, Christmas is not a bad time to do it because I think we all know what's going to come. I think we all know what I'm going to talk about today. It's not really a surprise. And I, I knew that back in college, doing all those papers and assignments last minute was going to pay off someday. So, yes. Now, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been preaching through Ruth. And originally the idea was to finish up Ruth, chapter 4, on today, Christmas Eve. And if you've read through the book, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the, how, how the story of Ruth ends, how it ties into the birth of Jesus and all that. But as John preached chapter 1, uh, we just really started to see that it wasn't going to work out. The timing wasn't going to be there. We weren't going to be able to hit that deadline. So this morning we just get a traditional Christmas sermon. And I know for many of you who've been alive a long time, going to church a long time, we hear this every year, right? The Christmas sermon, the Christmas story, we hear it every year. And maybe there's a, a tendency that it gets stale, it gets stale in our lives. Even as pastors preaching it every year, there's a tendency that it can get stale. And you may want to do something different and try and have something new, something fresh about Christmas, right? But the truth is that Christmas is the miracle of Jesus' birth. And that miracle is the beginning of the good news, the gospel. It's so powerful that though we may hear it 70 times in our lives, celebrated it every year, we should celebrate it every year. We should read the story, preach about it every year because it's worth it. And so that's what I plan on doing this morning. Nothing new, nothing fresh, just the Christmas story. The truth of Jesus' birth is what Christmas is all about. And so with that, if you'd like to open up to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, we will read the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. Now Luke chapter 1, I'll start in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. I'll pause there. So just a quick summary of how we got to this point in the story. Luke's gospel opens up with Another announcement, another angel coming to someone and saying, you're going to have a child. The announcement actually of John the Baptist's birth. 
the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah, the priest, and says, you will have a child. And Zechariah and his wife are uh, getting up in their years and have not had a child thus far. They're believed to be barren, and so they're like, you know, how will this be? But it will be, because John the Baptist has to come before Jesus to prepare the way. And so, at this point in the story, Elizabeth, who we will find out later is a relative to Mary, is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And that's where the angel Gabriel now comes to Mary, to Nazareth, the town where she was, and speaks to her. And uh, we see another important detail here in the story, that Mary's pledged to be married to a man. She's pledged to be married to a man, maybe if you have a more traditional Bible, King James it might say betrothed. And a lot of times we might think that being betrothed or pledged to be married is similar to being engaged. Because that's our culture. That's the mindset, the thinking that we have. Those things might be similar. But the reality is that being pledged to be married here, the being betrothed, is not really like our engagements here. Uh, it's more akin to actually being married than it is the engagement process. Uh, because being engaged in our culture, the goal, of course, is marriage, but there's a possibility that you will not get married. That is a reality. We've probably known people in our lives who've been engaged at some point. It didn't work out. I actually know someone that was engaged three times, and it didn't work out before they got married. That's never the goal, but it's an option. And, you know, if you break up an engagement, you can go on with your separate lives. Nothing's really been ruined or destroyed. But here with Mary and their culture, things are different. Their being pledged to marry, being pledged to be married, is started with a formal contract where the soon-to-be husband, the man, comes to the father and says, you know, I want to be married to your daughter. The father agrees. The man gives the father a bride price, a dowry, maybe some goats, some cows, something. i um, glad we don't do that anymore. But he gives them something to say, I have the intention to marry your daughter. Here's essentially a down payment for that. And the father agrees, and so a contract is made. And so the woman and the man, at this point in their stage, are pledged to be married. And they're actually referred to as husband and wife at that point, and they are essentially in a committed marriage, except there's no consummating of the marriage. They're not living together yet. That's about in a year. So after that contract, in a year, then they have a formal ceremony of marriage, the traditional ceremony of marriage that we might think of, and from that point on, the marriage is fully realized. They're fully married. And so that in-between stage is not like our engagement, it's more serious, it's more committed than that, and actually, if you were going to break it off, it would qualify as a divorce. To break off this engagement, this pledge, is actually going to qualify as a divorce. And so it's a very serious business for them. It's a very serious situation that we see. Now, another important detail that we learn there in verse 27 is that the man she's pledged to be married to is named Joseph. He's a descendant of David. And we know from many prophecies throughout the Old Testament that the nation of Israel was, you know, not their own nation anymore. They were conquered by many different nations, and so they're waiting for their restoration. They're waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, to come to be able to set up the kingdom once again. And that this Messiah is going to be from the line of David, the Davidic line, the kingly line, King David. And so this is an important detail for us that Joseph is from the line of David. But we continue reading, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Now when I read about angels appearing to people throughout Scripture, I often think, you know, wow, wow. That would be an amazing thing, right? How cool would it be? You're just minding your own business, maybe driving along or whatever it is, and all of a sudden, poof, there's an angel. You're like, where did you come from? How did that happen? But then the angel says to you, you are highly favored with God. I mean, that's some great news. I would love to hear that in my life. It's just amazing, outstanding stuff right there. But the more I thought about it, you know, it's actually a pretty frightening thing. If you're just minding your business, doing your own thing, you know, maybe you're in your room, doors are locked, you're in your house, nice, safe, and secure, and then boom, all of a sudden someone's next to you, and you're like, how did you get in here? 
You know, who are you? What do you want? What is about to happen to me? And so almost every single time that we see an angel appear throughout Scripture, the first thing they say is, do not be afraid. Fear not, do not be afraid. And that command, it's actually interesting to see that that is the most frequent command in Scripture. In the different iterations it appears, uh, fear not, do not be afraid, have no fear, that's the most repeated command throughout Scripture. And I want to think about that for a second. Uh, there's actually a scholar who estimates that there's 365 times it's said. Uh, if that number sounds familiar, it's because normally that's how many days we have in the year. And so there's a book that actually goes through uh, a fear not for each day of the year, and you can find it on Amazon. It's kind of cool to read through that. But why is that command so repeated? You know, you might think of what is going to be the most repeated command throughout Scripture. Uh, well, maybe something like, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, the most important command in all scripture, maybe. Why not that be the most repeated command? Or something from Jesus' ministry. Something about believing in Jesus, living your life for God. Something like that might be the most repeated command. Why is it, do not be afraid? Do not be afraid. I think so often for us as humans, we naturally get afraid of things. There's many things that scare us. You know, as we get older, it's no longer the dark or spiders or creepy things like that. It's more adult things, right? Fear of the unknown. Fear of the future. Fear of, you know, what if I lose my job? Or what if I, this or that happens to me? Fear of not being able to control things. And so I think it's for a few reasons that this command, do not be afraid, is so often repeated in Scripture. See, fear freezes us. Fear has the ability to stop us from acting, and so often in Scripture, God has called people to do something great, something courageous, something grand for his plan, and fear has the option to stop them from accomplishing what God has asked them to do or called them to do. And so he encourages them, do not be afraid, because he knows that fear could stop them in their tracks before they're able to accomplish what he wants them to do in their lives. Now, another reason that fear could be so often a bad thing for us in our lives is that fear can either freeze us, yes, but also it can motivate us to do something that we aren't supposed to do. Oftentimes, people are called to do something throughout Scripture. I can think of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah were without child. God is continuing to tell them, you are supposed to be, your children or your descendants are supposed to be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky, truly uncountable, and all the world will be blessed through you. But Abraham and Sarah are looking at each other like, we don't have a child. What, how is this going to be accomplished? And I can see the control trying to take over in their own lives. As we read the accounts in, in Genesis where Abraham actually gives, uh, a- Sarah actually gives Abraham her maidservant to sleep with because they're trying to accomplish the things through their own power, through their own strength and ability. In their example, fear caused them to do something but not what God had asked them to do, instead of freezing them. So, so often in our lives, fear has that ability to either freeze us and stop us from doing what God has called us to do, or it can make us do something God didn't want us to do, and make a mess of things, try and take things into our own hands, our own control. And so it's important that we remember this command, fear not, do not be afraid, fear not, as the angel tells me. Mary. But Mary does not freeze. The fear doesn't freeze her. And she's able to overcome the fear. And now I also think that it's interesting that the angel begins this conversation by telling Mary that she's found favor with God. She's found favor with God. And he repeats it twice. It's an amazing thing, but I'm a curious person, and so I'd love to know, you know, right? How did Mary find favor with God? Did she do something incredible with her life? You know, Mary's likely in her early teens here. She hasn't really lived that long of a life. What is it that causes this teenager to find favor with God and to get chosen out of all the other, I'd say, millions of women in the world at this point that could carry Jesus? What is it about Mary that she receives this designation? Now, we aren't told throughout Scripture how she came to find favor with God, only the fact that she did. 
Now, I would love for an angel to come and tell me that. I think most of us would, that we would find favor with God. But we see in verse 29 that Mary's greatly troubled at the words. Mary's greatly troubled at the words. And, you know, why is that? Because this is really a good thing. It's an honor. You've found favor with God. Very cool thing, very high thing. But Mary's greatly troubled. And I think sometimes it's not always about the words that are said, but it's about the context, right? Maybe your boss comes to you and says, you know, hey, Jim, we love the work that you that you've been doing lately, you've been doing a great job, but and there's always something more, right? There's always something more. And so sometimes we are waiting for that other shoe to drop when we receive compliments because we're not used to just getting complimented and nothing's going to follow it up. You've been doing a great job at work, we love what you've been doing, but there's no Christmas bonuses this year. We love what you've been doing, but we're going to have to cut back your hours. We love what you've been doing, but we're going to have to let you go. So we're always worried that something else is going to follow it. I mean, for those of you who are parents, you probably understand, you know, your children come to you and they start buttering you up. They're like, Dad, I just love you so much, and I just really need a new phone for Christmas. Right? There's always something else. You know, what do you want? Is that the response, you know? The wife comes home and the house is all clean. The dishes are washed and put away. It's clearly been vacuumed. The bed's been married. And she's like, well, what do you want? Because it can't just be that simple, right? But for Mary, she's wondering, what else is going to come? I'm highly favored by God. That's pretty cool to hear. But what else is going to come? And so the angel t- says to her, you will conceive and give birth to a son, verse 31. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great. And we'd be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will have no end. And boom, the other shoe has dropped. Now we see why the angel has come to her, more than just to say that God's really happy with you. Yeah, Mary, you found favor with God, and now he wants you to become pregnant. He wants you to become pregnant to carry the baby, and to give birth to the Savior of the world. Wow. Talk about a high request. And now truthfully, I'm glad I'm a man. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think men have it easier in life. Maybe just simply not having to give birth, that alone, I'm glad I'm a man. No doubt about it. Now this proclamation from the angel Gabriel would have brought some mixed emotions for Mary. Some mixed emotions. First, she's highly favored by God, gets to be the mother of Jesus, who of course we know is going to restore the nation of Israel in in an interesting way, the way that they didn't expect, but also to be the savior of the world. I mean, a very high honor, and so she could be elated about this. You know, this is an awesome moment for her in life. But then, you know, you might start to think about it practically. Mary is betrothed, she's pledged to be married to a man, she's a virgin, And if she becomes pregnant, she's going to be divorced. She's going to lose her husband. Because Mary and Joseph are not together at this point, sleeping together. And so everyone would know if Mary becomes pregnant, something's happened in this situation. Something's happened here that's just not quite right. I mean, up until this point in life, no one had ever gotten pregnant without having sex first. And even today... 2,000 years later, we know the story, we've read it. You know, if you've got children that come to you and your daughter's pregnant, you'd be like, hmm, I think something happened there. We wouldn't believe it today. Why would anybody have believed it back then? And so this is a very serious thing for her. For Mary, for women especially during this culture, being pledged to be married, getting married, was kind of the start of your adult life and receiving a lot of blessings in life. It would offer protection, offer, you know, things that they want, being able to be pregnant, have children, and have that life. And so for her to become pregnant outside of marriage, she would obviously get divorced. And we see later in the story that Joseph understands that she becomes pregnant and says, you know, that's not mine, and is already planning on divorcing her before the angel comes to her and comes to him and says, hey, this is from the Lord, stick with her. And think about her family. Think about all the different people around them in the town that would see what's going on, that would know they're not married yet. Why is Mary pregnant? It's not really something you hide. 
And this would change her life drastically. She'd be publicly shamed. She'd probably be seen as an adulteress because she's pledged to be married and Joseph says it's not mine. But before she gets ahead of herself, you know, she asks a good question. Verse 34. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, how will this be? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question to ask. Good question to ask. It's not an easy situation. And, you know, going through Bible college, I've always been curious, you know, how does Mary become pregnant? And so going to a Bible college, learning from the experts, one uh, respected scholar, Phil Long, if you know who he is, very very intelligent guy, honestly. He's got so many degrees, I can't even count. You go in his office, it's just wall-to-wall books. He doesn't even have walls, it's just books surrounding him. But Phil Long would say in his class about how Mary gets pregnant, verse 35 there, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will shadow you. So the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary, and poof, there's a fetus. And that's the scientific explanation behind it. That's it. Poof, there's a fetus. So it, maybe you were confused beforehand about how Mary got pregnant, but you don't need to be confused anymore. That's it. Poof, there's a fetus. Mm -hmm. Four years at Bible college, that's what you'll learn. Poof, there's a fetus. So the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary. The power of the Most High overshadows her, and the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, even Elizabeth, the angel continues, your relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. The angel bringing this up, kind of saying, hey, you know your uh, relative Elizabeth here was said to not even be able to have a child, but you can see she's six months along with her baby. That was thought to be impossible. This is thought to be impossible, but have faith, trust in God. It will come to pass. Verse 37, no word from God will ever fail. This will happen. And I love Mary's response at the end here. Mary's response, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Mary's question earlier, when the angel says that you'll become pregnant, she says, you know, how can this be? How can this be? I think so many of us in our lives ask God the same question. When the Holy Spirit puts puts a desire on us, puts a conviction on us, when God says this will happen for us in our lives, and we ask God, how can that be? How can that be, God? Because have you thought about this? How am I going to have a family? Have you thought about this? You know? And we bring these situations to God and we say, how can this be? And we doubt the things that he's going to do in our lives. We doubt that he's got control of our lives because we don't see him acting in our everyday, day-to-day -day life. And so we think, I need to take control of it for myself. Because I'm the one making decisions. I'm the one steering the car, making sure we go here and there. We ask that question, how can this be? Now often we don't get a direct answer like Mary got here, explaining how it's going to happen. Instead, we get God's written word to us. All the promises all the fulfillment of those promises, all the ways that God has provided for so many people throughout Scripture that we can see God is faithful. And we have something that many of them didn't have at this point. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. As Christians, as believers, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and empowering us to live this life from God, from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit working through us. Many of the heroes of the faith that we think of throughout Scripture, they didn't have that luxury. The Holy Spirit would come upon them for a time. Think of Samson, think of King Saul. The Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would be empowered, but the Holy Spirit could just as easily leave their lives. Think of how sad that would be. You know, being King Saul, being so high, and the Holy Spirit is filling you and you're doing all these awesome things for God, but then the Holy Spirit leaves. And your relationship is never the same with God. But for us, that is not a reality. The Holy Spirit will never leave us. God will never forsake us. And so when he asks us to do something, when he puts something on our hearts, on our lives, and says, this is what I want you to do, we can have confidence, we can have strength in God and the Holy Spirit to work through us and to bring it about.
If God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And we can trust in him for that. We don't have to let the fear freeze us from acting. We don't have to let the fear cause us to go about things a different way and try and bring them up over or un, under our own strength. We can simply say what Mary said in verse 38 here. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She recognizes that God is the creator of everything. God's the creator of everything, including us. As his creation, God has every right to use me, to use you, however he sees fit. God has created us. He's created this world. He sustains everything. And so he is the one that gets to decide what use, what purpose the world has, what use, what purpose we have. And our response should be like this of Mary. I think, how great is it as a parent when you ask your children to do something and instead of complaining and grumbling under their breath, you know, I don't really want to do that, they actually go and do it. And they just say, okay, I'll do it. Or, even better, you don't even have to ask them to do something. They come to you and say, hey, Dad, hey, Mom, what can I do to help out around the house? Now you hear that, and you know they're going to ask for something for Christmas. But what if they didn't? What if that was their attitude? What if that's our attitude towards God? See, God loves a willing servant. God loves a willing servant. A servant who says, I am here to be used. We think of Isaiah, prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament. Here I am, Lord, send me. That mindset. Nothing is going to be too great for us. Nothing is going to be too scary for us. Whatever your desire is, God, I will say yes, and I will go and do it. See, when we think of the relationship that God has with the nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament, if I thought, if I asked you to just say what's the first thing that you think of when you think of Israel and God in the Old Testament and what that relationship was characterized by, maybe the first thing that we would think of is the sacrificial system or the law. The law, the sacrificial system, that was a huge part of the Old Testament and the nation of Israel. All of their day-to-day -day lives was bound up in trying to follow the law and when inevitably you messed up, making sacrifices to temporarily cover over it. And even without messing up, there was times for sacrifices. And so sacrifice was a huge thing for the Old Testament. But often, if that's how we would characterize their relationship, we would miss the point. And much of Israel missed the point from the Old Testament. Now I love this verse, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Some context here. King Saul is supposed to destroy the Amalekites. King Saul is supposed to destroy the Amalekites and everything. They've got all this sheep, all this land, the city, gold, silver, everything. He's supposed to destroy it. It's supposed to be consecrated to the Lord. That's what God has called him to do here. God gives them over to the Israelites. They have a uh, victorious battle. And King Saul and his men, instead of destroying everything, they take the sheep, they take the plunder, they even leave the king alive. And the prophet Samuel now comes to King Saul and confronts him. And Samuel can hear the bleeding of sheep, the noise that the sheep and the goats are making. And he asks King Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? To obey, is better to, to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. You see, Saul had tried to make the excuse that, you know, I've saved these things. Even though God told me I wasn't supposed to, I saved them so that I could sacrifice them to God. And how much better that would be, right? Because God loves the sacrifices. But Samuel says, no, you have missed the point. God doesn't delight in the sacrifice of burnt offerings and the fat of rams, the fat portions. God delights in obedience. Obedience to what he calls us to do. That's what God desires from us. Obedience. The sacrificial system, the whole law system, was never about the sacrifices itself. It was always about obedience. God was supposed to be Israel's king. They were supposed to follow him and be obedient to him. But of course, they didn't do the best job of that, and we know that through scripture, and we get to the point of needing Jesus to be born now. Now, in our lives, we often think that God desires things from us, like 
reading our Bibles, right? That's a good thing to do. God wants us to read our Bibles. God wants us to come to church. God wants us to pray and serve and give and do these things. And we get caught up in the doing. We get caught up, just like the nation of Israel did, in the doing of the sacrifices. Because we think that that's what God wants. And that's what God wants, so we'll give it to him. But what God wanted was a relationship, obedience with them. We talked about it earlier with the conference. That if we seek to please God in our lives, we seek to just do these things, we'll get caught up with that. And we'll lose sight of what it's all about. Trusting God, our relationship with God. The things are good and we can do them, but often they become the focus and we lose sight of what actually matters, the relationship. And that's what Israel's done at this point in their lives as well. See, Mary, she trusts in God. She's an obedient servant to the Lord and says, your will be done. And then she trusts in God for the outcome of it. Because I'm sure that this is the beginning, you know, she becomes pregnant, but for the next nine months, daily, I can think of the stress, the worry, the anxiety as thinking, you know, I'm developing a child here, and, you know, I know that God told me that I'm in the right here, I'm, I'm highly favored by God, but what is everyone else going to think? What about everyone else? They didn't have an angel appear to them and say, yeah, this is God's plan, they're going to assume things about me. They're going to look at me differently. They're going to treat me differently. And so having to live with that every day until we see Jesus born. She trusts in him along the way. And now I've saved the, the birth story until now. And I want to read it. And we can open up Luke chapter 2 now. I wanted to save it because everything else has been leading up to this thus far. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinerius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby, wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace on those to whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, that the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word, concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I love that story. And I think it's a lot of people's tradition to read the birth story on Christmas morning. It's our tradition maybe from Luke 2 or from Matthew or the other places where you can find it. To read the Christmas story together. And it's a good tradition. I think we should all do it. And I don't want us reading it this morning to stop you from doing it tomorrow. You can never have too much of the Christmas story. So keep that tradition alive. See, the greatest gift that any of us could receive on Christmas, put aside all the expensive toys that you desire as kids, the cool gadgets you might have, and put aside the even more expensive technology that we desire as adults, the greatest gift 
The true meaning of Christmas, the reason for the season, if you've been waiting for that cliche, is to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. To celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. We don't need to complicate it. We don't need to make it something else, something bigger. This is the birth of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the gospel, the good news. The angels say there, it's good news that will cause great joy for all of the world. And I don't want to take anything from it. But if we think about the gospel, with only the birth, there would not be much to the gospel. Because the gospel is Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. The birth is only the beginning. 1 Timothy 1.15 tells us Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. All throughout the Gospels, he says, I am here to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man has come to save the lost. And I think Jesus knew what it would take. Nothing short of him dying on the cross, shedding his blood for us, would fulfill his mission, his purpose from God, and would really take the birth story and make it the good news, the gospel that causes great joy for all of the world. See, without the cross, without Jesus' death, the birth really doesn't mean much. I mean, it's an amazing thing, Jesus, God himself, humbling himself to take on flesh, to become human like us, to endure, to experience all the things that we experience, to be able to relate to us in those ways. But without the death, without the cross, We're still in our sins. We have no way to have a relationship with God, and the birth is meaningless to us. See, this is the gospel, the good news that brings great joy to the world. But what breaks my heart is that it's not the good news to everyone, because not everyone believes. There's millions, billions of people in our world that still refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And for them, this is not good news. This is not the gospel. And that is tragic. Because Jesus has offered this freely to all of us. It doesn't matter, you know, if we're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor, whatever ethnicity we are, whatever language we speak. It doesn't matter any of that. God has offered salvation to everyone freely. All of us have the same responsibility in life. We have the same choice that we have to make. We have to come face to face with this question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? Is he my Lord? Is he my Savior? Do I believe what Jesus and God says about himself in the Bible? Do I believe the account? Is Jesus just some good teacher? Just some guy, you know, 2,000 years ago that changed history. Was he just a miracle worker? Was he just something else? Or is he really God himself in a human body come to die for us? This Christmas, today, tomorrow, I want us to really come face to face with this question. To take the time to think that think it through. Because there's many people who will go to a church majority of their lives, their whole lives and still never choose to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's a sad reality. So for each of us here, who is Jesus to us? Who is Jesus to you? I want us to wrestle with that question. Do we believe the Christmas story? What the angel says to Mary that he is to be the savior of the world, that he is to be the son of the most high God? Or is he just someone else? Talked about control earlier, how we all want control of our lives. You know, it's natural. We want to control the things that concern us, right? And it's, it's crazy to think that God has actually given us control of our destiny. God has given control of where we spend eternity to all of us. He's paid the price, and now we all have control. Will we spend eternity with God in heaven, in perfection, with everything greater than we can even think of? Or will we spend eternity in hell, apart from God, in torment? 
That is our choice. It's up to us. So the people who say, you know, I just, I just can't choose God because, you know, I, I want to have my own life and I want to do things my own way, it makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. God has given us control to determine where we will spend eternity. And eternity is so much longer than this life that we have here on this earth. So if you want to take control of your life today, then do so by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and by giving him your life. Because Jesus tells us, John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life to the fullest. It's paradoxical, but the fullest life is giving our life to God. Mary's response to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. That's how we get the most out of this life. That's how we truly have control, is by giving it up, giving it to God, and seeing what he does in our life in return. So my challenge for all of us this morning, believe in Jesus for salvation. We celebrate the Christmas season for this reason, because Jesus is the Savior of the world. He has come that we may all have salvation and that we may all have a relationship with God Almighty. And so if you have not done this yet this morning, don't let another moment pass you by. I can't think of a better time than right now. If you need some help, I'd love to you know, work you through that to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know Pastor John, so many others here in this church would love to help you through that. If you have questions, please do not be afraid to ask. But for those of us who have already received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, let's be ready for God to use us. Let's have that same attitude, that same mindset that Mary had when the angel says, you will become pregnant. You will carry Jesus, the Savior of the world. And she says, all right, I'm the Lord's servant. Let your word to me be fulfilled. If we have this attitude, I can only think of the amazing things that God will do in our lives. How he will change us and use us to work in the culture around us, the community around us, our family, other people's lives, to have fuller lives surrendered to God. And for those of us who already believe, let's take this time to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's make that our tradition tomorrow morning. Take the time to celebrate before we get to the gifts, before we get to the stockings, the different maybe food traditions you have, before we get busy with the hustle and bustle of having to get to the relatives and, you know, I've got three Christmases to make happen on Christmas. Let's just take a breath, read the story, and remember that Jesus has done this for us. He took on flesh for us. He gave up being in heaven having all of the heavenly glory, power, praise for us to be born in a dirty feeding trough, in a dirty inn, extra room, whatever it was, cave, hole in the rock, whatever it is. He gave all of that up for us. And so the least we could do is give him our lives back. So with that, Merry Christmas, and let's pray. Dear God, we praise you. We just praise you. The only response that we have is to praise you, God, for what you have done for us. You have made a way for us to be saved. You've made a way for us to have a relationship with you. You love us that much, each and every one of us. And so I pray for everyone here this morning that we may truly believe in you as our Savior, that we may come face to face with that question, that we may celebrate this time of Christmas with our family, with people around us, with those we love, and that we may remember to praise you, Lord, and to spread the good news that causes great joy for all the world. In your name we pray. Amen.